Hey guys, Mike here from Fortinet Guru. Last video, we showed you how to run through and do some basic configuration on a FortiGate. That would enable you to essentially get a brand new Soho unit into production, allowing packets to pass as desired and giving you visibility into your network. Now, a viewer had a very good point, made a comment on the video saying, Mike, you didn't do anything to discuss security from an administrative standpoint. And you know what? That person was right. So today we're going to talk about how to harden your device from a security perspective to make sure that you're able to access it from an administrative point of view and your engineers are able to, but hopefully you're able to keep the bad guys out. So stay tuned. All right, guys. So like I said, previous video, we specifically discussed how to get your FortiGate online and passing traffic. Our ultimate goal was to get it into the network, allowing traffic to flow and giving you the visibility necessary to slowly tighten that grip down. Um, obviously, from an administrative standpoint, we didn't really cover any details about how to make the device security hardened. Now, what I mean by security hardened is admins are only able to log in from sources or IP space, etc., or interfaces that you want them to. And this is essential. So in today's video, we're going to cover that. And we're going to go basically top to bottom on what I would do from a security perspective to help do so. So as you guys remember, this is my 61E. We took this device, we did a basic configuration on it specifically to show you what you would do top to bottom, left to right from a policy and security package point of view to get it running. Now this isn't gonna do any blocking. It's not sexy from a security perspective. And that's where we need to really jump in on this video. So number one, administrative access only needs to be enabled on interfaces you want to be able to access the device from. Anything else, you need to turn that off. So for instance, I might wanna be able to hit it from my internal interface. So I'll turn on HTTPS. I like to disable HTTP. I don't like that being an option. Um, SSH and ping. So what that means is this interface will now listen to requests for 443, uh, 22, and then ping. And what that does is that basically builds a, a, a a listener on the interface saying, you know, this is relevant to me. I should respond to this traffic. Now, if you want to enable access on interfaces, obviously you need to go through the work to actually disable access on interfaces. So what we need to do is you need to think about your interfaces from a security posture. Do I want to allow people to be able to administratively access my FortiGate from the DMZ port? Probably not. So you just go ahead and you turn all that stuff off. Even go as far as ping, because if the interface is responding to ping, you are providing potential intruders the knowledge that that IP has a device on it, it's listening in some fashion, and then they'll just start basically going against it really hard. Now, administrative access on your WAN interfaces. Depending on who you ask, there's going to be multiple trains of thought here. A lot of security professionals are purist. And what I mean by that is they believe firmly to their core that administrative access should never be enabled on an outside interface. And I get that. We want to reduce risk as much as possible where we can. Those are the types of folks that believe you should only be able to administer the box remotely if you come in through VPN and you're hitting it on an internal interface. And I support that. That's a good idea. Now, if you run a managed service provider or something like that, that's not always going to be the case from a business standpoint because, you know, security would just turn it all off. If you're running a business, you have to make things operational to the point that you can still execute business in a manner that is secure. So in a lot of those situations, people will in fact have administrative access on their outside interfaces. So what do we do to help mitigate that risk, right? What's the next thing that we can do outside of, of um, forcing them all through SSL VPN? Well, 
you've done step one. You've enabled administrative access on the interfaces you choose. You have removed in administrative access on interfaces you absolutely do not want them on. So now you're in a situation where you need to do the next level of defense. And what I mean by that is local end policies, trusted host, things like that. We need to lock down our administrative accounts, obviously. So go to system, administrators. You see here, I am still using the default admin account. This is a demo box specifically for configuring in videos. I don't do custom admin accounts on this because it doesn't do anything except hang out and let me play with it and beat the mess out of it. First things first, I would get rid of the default admin account. Create a non-standard administrative account. Don't name an admin, don't name it root, just name it, you know, mpruitt underscore admin or, you know, michael.pruitt or firstname.lat, you know, anything like that. Anything that kind of makes it to where they have to work a little bit harder to even get the account name right. Anybody scanning against the FortiGate knows the default admin account is admin. So create a non-standard administrative account. Step two, trusted hosts. What is that? Trusted hosts are an option on administrative accounts that basically say you can only log in from this IP space. What type of IP space should you put there? Well, first and foremost, have an account that does not have trusted host enabled, create your non-standard account, apply trusted host to it, and then test. That way you don't lock yourself out of the box. But basically what you do is under administrators, you click and edit the administrative account that you desire. And then you click this little checkbox here, restrict login to trusted host. Now, depending on your environment, you wanna put IP space here that is relevant. So for instance, you know, if your internal network is 192.168.0.0 slash 16 or 10.0.0.0 slash 8 or 172.16.0.0 slash 12. That's RFC 1918 space. That's all the internal space on the planet that you could possibly come from on the inside. Well, I want to be able to log into that administrator account on the outside. How do I set IP space here? It's the same way. It's public space, 1.2.3.4 slash 32. Let's say you have a static IP address for your home office or the office where you do all of your management from. You just set that as a trusted host. Now, as long as that source traffic is coming from that IP, you can log in as that user from that IP. Now, obviously, you're not going to want all of RFC 1918 space listed as your trusted host, unless you just have a network so massive that you could possibly come from any of those locations. You want to shrink it down from networks that you trust from a management perspective. So you click OK. And now you see those are the IP subnets that I'm able to log into that account with. What does this mean? Trusted host does a couple of things. One, it does not impact the FortiGate responding to administrative request on an interface that has it enabled. All it does is limit what source IPs or what source subnets an admin account can specifically be logged in as. So what that means is the FortiGate, if it gets an HTTPS request or it gets an SSH request, it's going to respond. It just won't let the user log in unless one, the admin account and credential is correct, and two, the source IP subnet is listed in the trusted host. The next thing you can do to tighten down administrative access and security in general is two-factor authentication. Every FortiGate comes with two FortiToken token capabilities. So if you go into the admin account in question, you click two-factor, you can do the Forta token that is tied to the FortiGate itself. That'll be a mobile token that you use, so it'll give you a challenge response. And what that does is when enabled, now you have to one, be able to hit the IP from wherever you're coming from, two, know the administrative account and their credential, three, be coming from a source IP that that admin account can actually like log in from, and four, you have to have the response that it's gonna challenge you with from the token. 
that's a lot of hoops, but it still makes remote access extremely easy and relatively lightweight. Remember, I said putting trusted host on an admin account just means that that admin account can't be logged into unless you're coming from that source, right? But the FortiGate's still going to respond to the IP space initiating conversation with it. So if any IP out on the web, let's say you have WAN1 enabled for HTTPS, any of those little script kitties or tokens or anything like that that are beating the box, it's going to respond to those requests, which means they will know there's a security device there that they could probably try to, uh, you know, circumvent. Last, but certainly not least, local end firewall policies. What does this do? This enables you to say, hey, firewall, you're only going to uh, respond to these source IPs on this interface. So even though the interface has HTTPS enabled, it's only going to allow it from the source spaces that you tell it to. Now, this is a CLI driven thing. So let's jump through and I'll show you some tricks. First things first, build address objects and address groups for your security access. So for instance, I know for a fact that I'm coming from 10.100.100.0/24. That's my home IP space. My home internal network IP space. This FortiGate lives behind my network. So and what you do is you say, you know, be very descriptive. You want your address objects to tell you what they are. Home network management source because this is the home network and this is how I'm going to manage it. And you do that in there. And then if I was to administer this box from a public IP space, public management source one. And for the sake of this, I'm just going to go 1.2.3.4 slash 32 because this device will never ever be administered from the outside. So you have your two potential sources here, right? Those are the two IP address spaces that I want these devices to respond to any administrative request from to even allow someone to see the login page. So now I go to address group and go to create new and then say management sources. And I throw those two guys in there. So where are they? Home management and public management. Those are the two sources. Now, the reason why we're doing an address group here is so that when we build our local end policy, it can be simpler, it can be cleaner. And that gives us the ability to manage it from this group instead of having to go in and manually update the local end policies, giving you opportunity for mistakes. So I created a group called Managed Sources and then I threw in the IPs that I wish to be able to hit administratively from. Now you go into your firewall and you do config, firewall, local dash in dash policy and click enter. If you do a get, you see there's nothing here. You do a show, there's nothing there. What is this? This is telling you how you want to allow things into the interface itself. So I am managing this device from the WAN one interface, which happens to be internal to my network. So I would do edit zero to create the next firewall policy in line for this. And I would set my interface WAN one. And if you do a get, you can see the various parameters here. So now I can do set source address to my management network sources group, right? And then you can set destination addresses to all, because that means any IP that's on the interface. So now we need to set our action. Set action accept. We want this connection to actually be accepted and for us to respond against it. And then we want our schedule to be set to always. You can get really clever here. You can use custom schedules saying that this will only be in place during certain times of day, times where you know you'll need to be able to access it. Does that leave you in a pinch in case something goes sideways? Maybe, but you might have different tiers of policy, right? You might have these sources that can hit any time. These sources are only able to hit it Monday through Friday, eight to five. So you have some flexibility there. You're going to do set service HTTPS. That's the service that we're interested in here. You could obviously do SSH. 
much like we created our address group and our address objects before you can create custom service objects or service groups and use those as your defining item here especially if you use non-standard ports for your administrative access so now we have everything in here and we're going to go to set comments this is management access and go to next now we need to do our policy that's going to block all other communication otherwise so edit zero, this will be the next in line. And then set source address to all. Set destination address to all. And I'm gonna keep doing a get here so we can see it populate as we go. We're gonna set our interface to WAN1. And then we're gonna set our service to all. And then set schedule to always. Now, if you do a show, Remember, the firewall reads as it matches, top to down. So as you can see here, first policy is, if you're coming from these management sources, you can respond. Otherwise, you don't get anything. And that's pretty much how you turn a frown upside down. So security purist will without a doubt say, don't enable it on the outside interface. But as you can see, we have a wide range of things we can do to help harden the box, make it to where it doesn't respond. That way you don't have to worry about penetration testers or vulnerability assessors getting in and getting responses. But also, you don't have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops to be able to manage your box when you're not in the network. Don't use Screen Connect that can be compromised and you're having to jump in or TeamViewer or any desk or anything like that. Just hit the box direct. It's gonna be quicker anyways, using your actual screen and obviously, you have what's necessary to lock it down, minimize that risk, and give you the ability to perform work and make money. So just in summary, step one, enable administrative access on the interfaces you want to be able to administer the box from. Then remove administrative access from all other interfaces. Create non-standard administrative accounts and delete the standard admin one that comes with the box. Implement trusted host saying that you can only log in as this administrative user from these subnets or IPs. Take it a step further and do multi-factor on the administrative account. And then last but not least, do local end policies to make sure that your box only responds to IPs that you desire it to regardless of trusted host. Now you don't have to worry about scanners and all those little script kitties that are gonna be beating up the box on a daily basis just hoping something responds so that it can take advantage of some CVE that exists that we don't know of. So, guys, I hope you're having a wonderful new year. It's New Year's Day, and for once I'm not hungover. It feels good. Do me a favor, if you liked the video, hit like, hit subscribe if you haven't already. But most importantly, comment below with what you would like to see next. On top of that, do me a favor and check out at Packet Llama on YouTube. It's the general networking channel run by yours truly. We are just starting out. We are also a value added reseller for Fortinet hardware and we're just trying to get our wheels spinning a little bit. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you. Know that you're loved and hopefully your 2024 is off to a wonderful start. Thank you.